Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Today's video will be entitled Military Hollywood History Part 7. Part 7. All right, let's get busy. I want to start off over at Benedict Canyon and make sure I emphasize a few historical facts and murders that occurred over there in that military controlled canyon in Beverly Hills, 90210. Then we will segue over to Laurel Canyon and we will go up to the tippy top near Mulholland Drive and Woodrow Wilson Drive and Laurel Canyon Boulevard and we will examine some murders that happened in a tight cluster group there. Then we will make our way down the mountain to, the, to uh, Hillcrest and Franklin Avenue where Janis Joplin was murdered in the Landmark Hotel at 7047 Franklin Avenue, adjacent to the Magic Castle, renamed the Cabaret of Magic in the Columbo television episode. Now You See Him, starring Jack Cassidy, which was released in 1976, the same year that Jack Cassidy was incinerated beyond recognition, requiring dental records to identify him. Anyway, what I wanted to tell you is we're going to hit those three items. Uh, I select my homicides uh, based upon seeing clusters in a tight zip code neighborhood or if I see that the people are in the same business together or if um, it, it, it interests me because I want to um, emphasize that there are dozens of murder homicides throughout Hollywood, Beverly Hills, um, Brentwood, the greater San Fernando Valley, Studio City, Encino, Van Nuys, Woodland Hills, West Lake Village, West Hills, Hidden Hills, Lost Hills, Canoga Park that I am not covering in my videos. There are, it's probably over a hundred, okay? So I'm um, just cherry picking out you know a couple of dozen homicides that I'm examining okay this can go on for a lifetime okay certainly it took at least a hundred lives to create the story alright so getting started with today's video let's go over to Benedict Canyon I want to emphasize that the Sharon Tate Abigail Folger um, Tom Coomer J. Sebring murders were not the first nor were they the last to occur in Benedict Canyon. There were many murders that happened before and there's been many murders that have happened since. It's just that it doesn't get the 50 years of um, promotion on the fake media television to burn a false narrative into your brain to make a lie become the truth. That's the only reason why people think that, that there's a Charlie Manson. And they even came up with a nickname uh, of the family members of the Manson, call them Mansonites. And anyone who calls the Manson, they call the Sharon Tate murders a Manson murder, or they call it the, his followers of Mansonites, just delete that person. They are so full of poppycock, I can't believe it. There never was a Charlie Manson in the first place. So you can't have a Mansonite unless you at least have a Manson. And we don't have a Manson in the story. We have a Charles Miles Maddox what it said on his birth certificate for crying out loud. And then his 15-year-old mother, teenaged mother, uh, who was unmarried at the time that Charles Miles Maddox was born, hence he took his mother's name, because her name was Maddox. Anyway, his middle initial, middle name is Miles. His mother's name was Maddox. Then she went on to marry a guy named Manson for a few months and divorced him before Charlie Miles Maddox ever got to know him. So there's no recollection of any Manson in Charlie Miles Maddox's life. All right. Uh, I guess I could go back earlier than this, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go back to November 19th, 1924, and Thomas H. Insay was found dead in his beautiful home on Benedict Canyon Drive, to be specific, 1051 Benedict Canyon Drive. It's just below the murder scene for Sharon Tate and Abigail Folgers, just down the hill. 
uh, realized they were killed off Cielo Drive or more specifically, they were killed off Angelo Drive. But Angelo Drive and Cielo Drive flank 1051 Benedict Canyon Drive. It's the same zip code 90210. It's walking distance from the Sharon Tate murder scene. You could walk to Thomas H. Insay. However, there are no sidewalks. So the walk is a little bit dangerous because there's quite a bit of traffic on Benedict Canyon Drive and there's no sidewalks. So November 19th, 1924, there's so much poppycock associated with this murder. I'm calling it a murder and I'm calling it he was shot in the head. Okay, and he was shot in the head on William Randolph Hearst's yacht. Now, William Randolph Hearst had five yachts over the course of his life, and uh, three of those yachts were built, constructed, and available at the time that Thomas H. Insay was shot in the head. He was a studio executive in Hollywood, and he was very friendly with Marion Davies, who is a very young woman um, who is the girlfriend of William Randolph Hearst, who is quite jealous. William Randolph Hearst is married, okay? He's 34 years older than Marion Davies, okay? He's 34 years older, and his actress girlfriend is flirting with mostly married men. Charlie Chaplin, she had an affair with him, allegedly. She had an affair with Thomas H. Insay, allegedly, and, and others, which I'm not going to get into. But the point is that uh, William Randolph Hearst hosted a birthday party out of San Diego for Thomas H. Ensay. And Charlie Chaplin and his then wife were invited. And of course, Marion Davies was there. Now, the yacht that we're talking about is about 180 feet long, and it's the called the uh, Onelda, spelled O-N-E-L-D-A, the Onelda. And they sailed out of San Diego Harbor. And this is very similar to the Natalie Wood story. And uh, there was alcohol involved. It's a birthday party. Allegedly, Thomas Ensay drank champagne and salted almonds, which apparently upset his, uh, his ulcers. He's only 44 years old, however, so I'm not sure this is a legitimate story. Anyway, it was said that he had indigestion and heartburn and he needed to go to home to see his doctor so he was taken to the railroad station in San Diego to be sent up to Beverly Hills to his 1051 address on Benedict Canyon. However Charlie Chan's uh, then ex-wife uh, said later that she saw Thomas and say removed from the Onelda on a stretcher with blood bleeding from his head from what appeared to be a gunshot wound. Anyway, Thomas Anse, according to the reports, only made it as far as Del Mar, which is North San Diego near La Jolla. Del Mar is just above La Jolla. It's called the slums of La Jolla. Anyway, he had to be hospitalized there. Then he had uh, up to four private physicians examine him. They went back on the train and took him up to Beverly Hills, whereupon he died at 1051 Benedict Canyon Drive in his home below the Sharon Tate murder scene, which of course hadn't happened yet. That doesn't happen for another uh, 45 years. This is 45 years before Sharon Tate, and we have what appears to be a gunshot victim, Thomas H. Ensay. But it appears that he perhaps was shot at sea on the Onelda with William Randolph Hearst as the likely gun shooter. However, he could have had one of his party guests do it because you know he's a very wealthy person, right? Anyway, that was the first uh, murder homicide in Benedict Canyon that I'm going to discuss. There probably were others before this, so don't hold me to it. Okay, then let's go out eight years and we have Paul Levy Byrne, who's 42 years old, and he's married to Jean Harlow, and they're living at 9820 Easton Drive. That's a familiar address because that's where Jay Sebring was given housing. I'm sure it's a free rent home. I'm sure that Paul Levy Byrne, who also is an um, agent for actresses, that's how he met Gene Harlow. Um, I'm sure he uh, got this home for free as part of the Hollywood establishment. On September 5th, 1932, Paul Byrne decides to commit suicide. He types a suicide note, doesn't sign it. 
and blows his brains out with a 38 caliber pistol, allegedly, while he's sitting in front of Jean Harlow's vanity mirror um, covered in her perfume, that he puts Jean Harlow's perfume on himself, types the suicide note, then shoots himself in the head in front of Jean Harlow, who's 21 years old. He's 20, she's 21. She's his second wife. He's her second husband. He's 42, she's 21, and he's dead. Then Jean Harlow goes on to get married a third time, get divorced, then is shacking up with Bill Powell, William Powell, whereupon she dies of acute barbiturate poisoning, which they call renal failure. And she's 26 years old, the same age as Sharon Tate when she dies. So right there, I've got Thomas Ensay, dead at 44, living in Benedict Canyon at 1051. I got Paul Levy Byrne, dead in Benedict Canyon at 9820 Easton Drive at age 42. I got Jean Harlow dying four years later at age 26. And she used to live in Benedict Canyon, so that's three. Then I go out to June 16, 1959. I got George Reeves, Superman. He has his head blown off at 1579 Benedict Canyon Drive. He has his fiancée in the house at that time with him. He's 45 years old. They're planning to go to Mexico for their wedding in a few days. And the other curious thing is that there were three expended cartridges in the bedroom where George Reeve was murdered, and two of the bullets were dug out of the hardwood floor, and one was dug out from the ceiling. So I'm having a hard time understanding how, if you're going to commit suicide with a pistol that you'd miss, you'd require three shots to your head, missing the first two times and then hitting yourself on the third. I find this very strange. <laughs> Anyway, like I said, that's, uh, that's June 16th, 1959. This is, these are all murders that are occurring before Sharon Tate. Thomas Ensay, Paul Byrne, Gene Harlow, Superman George Reeves. That's four murders in Benedict Canyon before we get to Sharon Tate. We've already had four. And don't forget, don't forget, William Randolph Hearst's uh, love interest, 34 years old, younger than him, Marion Davies, she has a, a street in Benedict Canyon named after her sometime after the murder of Thomas H. Ensay. Davies Drive is baptized. Davies Drive connects Angelo Drive to Cielo Drive. It's directly above the Sharon Tate murder scene. So in other words, this name change of a connector road called Davies Drive which is directly above the Sharon Tate murder property, the Love House. It's above Sunbrook Drive, Bella Drive, Cielo Drive off Cielo Drive. And just the next street up is Davies Drive. And it goes over to Cielo Drive, where Cielo Drive tees into it. Immediately below the Enchanted Hillside, which today is owned by the Paul Allen Land Trust. And that place is guarded with security gates, cameras, and concert Tina Wire Bob Wire. And they haven't built any homes on the Enchanted Hillside yet. However, they have paved a tunnel system and a road that eventually goes from Angelo Drive. It's technically Angelo Drive, but it has a gate, a fortress gate. And uh, it eventually winds around and plops down to Benedict Canyon Drive, further up the mountain, right? But below, below Mulholland Drive, but above Cielo Drive. The Enchanted Hillside, which has been featured in a Columbo episode named Identity Crisis. Anyway, I just wanted you to know that William Randolph Hearst is implicated in the murder, possibly shotgun to the head, shot by a pistol to the head of Thomas H. Insay. That was in 1924. And the reason I say that is this, this yacht, this magnificent 180-foot Onelda, was disposed of, gotten rid of by William Hearst shortly after the death of Thomas Ensay, sort of like destroying the crime scene, right? And then he goes on to, you know, build two more yachts before he eventually dies himself. At uh, And William Randolph Hearst, just so you know, he died in 1951. 
and uh, he died at age 88. And um, Marion Davies, his much younger, 34 younger, 34 years younger mistress, she dies 10 years after William Randolph Hearst. She dies in 1961 at the age of 64. Okay? All right, that concludes my discussion of Benedict Canyon. Let's uh, head west, I mean, let's head east. Let's head east over to West Hollywood and uh, turn left on uh, Laurel Canyon Boulevard and let's climb to the tippy top to Mulholland Drive. Let's make a right and then let's turn right on Woodrow Wilson Drive because we're going to go to the home of Inger Stevens. Okay, very important person in my story. Inger Stevens. Inger Stevens... Uh, was murdered at age 35. She was born in Stockholm, Sweden. She was born in 1934, October 18th, 1934. She was murdered April 30th, 1970. So about six months after the Sharon Tate murder, we have the Inger Stevens murder. Her name was um, Ingrid Stensland. Ingrid Stensland was her true name. Inger Stevens was her CIA Hollywood cover name. She was given provisional housing, like all the contracted stars are. And don't forget, it's producers, directors, people like William Link, people like Jose Menendez, who's a pornography producer, essentially, when he killed, was killed in Beverly Hills. It's... Um, it's people that work for the Rand Corporation. That's who lived at 277 for Woodstock Road before Abigail Folger was moved in there. It was a Rand Corporation engineer. And uh, Inger Stevens was moved into 8000 Woodrow Wilson Drive. Okay? And that's where she was found dead. Now, the media says she had a roommate. That's not really true. She had a hairdresser. She had a hairdresser who she let sleep over there some nights. So Inger Stevens um, was dating Burt Reynolds at the time of her death. And he was the last person to see her alive. Burt Reynolds, the movie Deliverance had just been released. And you know Hollywood never allows a scandal or a murder to get in the way of a blockbuster film. That was true with William Randolph Hearst and the death of his friend Thomas Insay. They didn't implicate him in that and they came out with multiple false narrative, parallel narratives as to how Thomas Insay was killed. They said he had congenital heart failure and that he had thrombonic clot and they said a lot of things. They didn't mention headshot by a, by a pistol but uh, Charlie Chaplin's wife did mention that. So you have these cover-up stories standard in all these Hollywood murders. So Inger Stevens is living at 8000 Woodrow Wilson Drive. It's her hairdresser who discovers her on the floor of the kitchen um, on April 30th, 1970. Okay? And Burt Reynolds had been there the previous night. Inger Stevens did have a habit of um, having affairs with older men. She had an affair with Bing Crosby, James Mason, and Cecil B. DeMille, who were all much older men. So it's kind of a similar situation as Marion Davies, because she had an affair with William Randolph Hearst, who was married. She had an affair with Thomas Insay, who was married at the time, and it looks like murdered by her jealous lover. And um, she also had an affair with Charlie Chaplin, who was married. So why would Inger Stevens be different, right? Anyway, she's dead. And Thomas Noguchi, the um, Tokyo born and raised coroner of Los Angeles, he rules it a suicide and acute barbiturate poisoning. Now, the problem that I got here, people, with this is, uh, don't forget, just a few months earlier we had we had Diane Linklater thrown out of her Shoreham Tower six-floor apartment onto the sidewalk at North Horn Avenue in West Hollywood. That was on October 4th, 1969, right? So that's six months before Inger Stevens was killed. 
Then four days later, on October 8, 1969, we had Connie Monte, who's the next door neighbor across the North Horn Avenue at 1211 North Horn Avenue. And she attends the funeral service for Diane Linklater. And she comes home and um, she gets murder suicided at 1211. And John's walk, and, and it turns out that this Ed Durston it lives in that apartment and is her neighbor. And Ed Durston was in the kitchen of Diane Linklater baking cookies at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning when Diane Linklater was thrown out of her window balcony and does a face plan into the sidewalk. And he even tells police he was there. He said that he came over on you know, October 3rd, which would have been a Friday night, and uh, he came over at 3 o'clock in the morning well, pardon me, that would have been Saturday morning at 3 a.m. He said he came over until she went flying out the window six hours later at 9 a.m. So he's been with Diane Linklater, who he says is his girlfriend. She's 20 years old. Ed Durston is 27 years old. He's there. Well, I don't know what police department you could possibly imagine where you wouldn't be arrested immediately. However, it's the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department is investing this, investigating this murder. They do take uh, Ed Durston in for a polygraph, which I believe he fails. They won't release the results. They're so disturbed by it that they bring him back the next day at 11 a.m. on Sunday, which would be October 5th, and they give him a second polygraph test, and they won't release the findings of that. And then they release him, and the district attorney does not charge Ed Durston, despite the fact that three days later, on Wednesday, uh, his neighbor... Connie Monte dies, and again, the coroner rules it acute barbiturate poisoning suicide, which eventually is what Inger Stevens' medical examination returns. So you got Connie Monte, acute barbiturate poisoning, Inger Stevens, acute barbiturate poisoning. Um, years earlier, we had Marilyn Monroe in 1962, acute barbiturate poisoning. That's three. So you got three women who were all declared suicide deaths. Marilyn Monroe, Connie Monte, who knows Diane Linklater and knows Ed Durston. And you got Inger Stevens, who knows Burt Reynolds. And she's secretly married to a black man. <laughs> so she's married too. And I think that Burt Reynolds is not quite divorced yet from his uh, Judy Karn, the socket to me girl from laughing that's who bill that's who burt reynolds is married to judy karn who went to the london academy for dramatic art judy karn the laughing socket to me lady so you got burt reynolds is married inger stevens is secretly married <laughs> and all these women are committing suicide you got diane linkletter jumping out of the building that the media says she's on lsd then you got the other girls are all acute barbiturate poisoning, taking sleeping pills. I don't believe any of these stories, all right? I'm just telling you. And they all happen quick like a bunny rabbit, right? October 1969, April, April 1970. Bang, bang, bang. I got three dead women. And then if you want to go back, you know, seven years, you can pull out Marilyn Monroe, and then you got four dead women. Okay, so... The other thing I wanted to bring to your attention is this uh, home where Inger Stevens was given provisional housing, 8,000 Woodrow Wilson Drive. It's walking distance. It's like two houses away from where Abigail Folger lives at 2774 Woodstock Road. It's right around the corner. Now, there's no sidewalks, but it's, it's like 200 yards away. It's really close. If you Google 2774 Woodstock Road to 8,000 Woodrow Wilson Road, you'll find that it's like 0.1%. 0.2 tenths of a mile away. And to make it more outstanding is that Cass Elliott, who has a one-year-old baby daughter, okay, Van Owen Vanessa Elliott, she's living, she's living at 2733 Woodstock Road, which is 150 feet away from Abigail Folger. So I got Abigail Folger, who's 25 years old. I've got Cass Elliott, who's, uh, let me think about this for a second. She's 29 years old, and they're living basically next door to each other. 
And they're right around the corner from Inger Stevens, who's 35 years old. So Inger Stevens is the oldest. And then Cass Elliott is 29. And then Abigail Folger is 25. And they all live basically on the same street, which is called Woodstock Road. Because the, the, the Inger Stevens Woodrow Wilson drive home backs up to Woodstock Road. So it's sort of kind of on both. It's on the corner of uh, Woodstock Road and um, Woodrow Wilson. Then let's not forget Natalie Wood. She had been previously living at 7708 Woodrow Wilson Drive off Woodrow Wilson Drive. Now, people, if you try to go find this on your own, you're not going to do well because Google won't help you. The Google Maps will not come up what I just, the address I just gave you. It's there, though. You just have to find the Woodrow Wilson Drive off Woodrow Wilson Drive. The problem is there are five Woodrow Wilson Drive cul-de-sacs off Woodrow Wilson Drive, the through street. So you have a very difficult time finding where Natalie Wood lived. The reason I bring that up is that Cass Elliott with her one-year-old baby daughter, Owen Vanessa, they move into the Natalie Wood uh, estate at 7708 Woodrow Wilson Drive. And to be really frank about it, if you crawled out the back of Abigail Folger's home at 2774, you would hit a cul-de-sac that's just right in her backyard. If you walk down that cul-de-sac, turn right, you'd be at the Natalie Wood home. I mean, as the crow flies, the Natalie Wood or Cass Elliott home is like 500 yards away from Abigail Folger. And it's about 700 yards away from Inger Stevens. And it's about 700 yards away from where Cass Elliott used to live in a Alpine style cabin house at, at, to, 733 Woodstock Road. Okay, so I got Inger Stevens, I got Abigail Folger, I got Cass Elliott, and I got Natalie Wood all living within a baseball throw of each other. And Natalie Wood is murdered, Cass Elliott is murdered, Abigail Folger is murdered, and Inger Stevens is murdered. So I got four women who all live within the same walking distance, and they're all murdered. And they all lived atop Laurel Canyon, near Mulholland Drive, and near Woodrow Wilson Drive. Woodrow Wilson is One World Order, Council for Foreign Relations. Um, the Bilderberg, you know, the Bilderberg hadn't come along yet, but he was a big believer in the League of Nations. He was a big believer in One World Government. And that is where those four women all lived off Woodrow Wilson Drive, and they were all murdered by NATO forces, in my opinion. Now let's go down the hill to the south. I, 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 there's more murders, and I'm going to skip over them. But let's just go south on Laurel Canyon Boulevard, and let's get down to West Hollywood, and let's go visit where, um, where Janis Joplin was killed in this hotel at 7047 Franklin Avenue. Yeah, 7047 Franklin Avenue. This hotel goes by many different names, people, which I think is deliberate on purpose. It's kind of a dumpy hotel. The reason why Frank Sinatra stayed there and Dean Martin stayed there and uh, the Jefferson Airplane stayed there and Siegfried and Royd stayed there, the reason was because it's close proximity to a number of recording studios. It's a mile away from Capitol Records Studio, the, the building that's shaped like a stack of disc records. But it is closer to other studios that are in that Hollywood Boulevard area. And uh, that's why they would stay there. Uh, shoot, now I can't find it. Anyway, that hotel went by the Hollywood Hotel. It went by the Landmark Hotel. It went by the Highland Hotel. It had a lot of different names. Today, I believe it's called the Hollywood Gardens Hotel. So again, it the address is all you need to know. 7047 Franklin Avenue. Janis Joplin was murdered, suicided in room 105, ground floor. It's right next door to the Magic Castle. On the east side of the Magic Castle, this is on the west side of the Magic Castle. On the east side of the Magic Castle is... 6871, an apartment building, 6871 Franklin Avenue at Orchid. 
There you had Charlie Miles Maddox living there in 1958-59 when he was an I called a soils geologist. We had Charlie Watson, the man who allegedly killed Sharon Tate and everybody else, but nobody talks about him. He lived there for free. Uh, Bernard Crow, a.k.a. Lots of Papa, he lived there. Um, so that's three CIA crisis actors who live for free at 6871 Franklin Avenue. And Jack Cassidy played the great Santini, who was a magician at the Magic Castle, renamed the Cabaret of Magic. And uh, he, his name was Ken Franklin in the first Columbo that he appeared, murdered by the book. And in the end, Jack Cassidy was incinerated beyond recognition, requiring dental records to identify him at 1221 North Kings Road, walking distance from where Art Linklater's daughter Diane was killed with Ed Durston in her kitchen baking cookies at 9 o'clock in the morning. This Ed Durston now is implicated in the death of Diane, yet he was never charged or never arraigned with the crime. He's also implicated in the murder of uh, Connie Monte, but he wasn't arrested or arraigned in that crime, which happened four days after the first crime. Then we have a little pause, and Ed Durston reappears again. I think we all know Johnny Carson and The Tonight Show, right? And on that Tonight Show, there was an actress who did bit parts with Johnny when Johnny liked to play a used car salesman, Fern. I forgot the name of that character that Johnny Carson played. Anyway, um, the matinee lady, Carol Wayne. Carol Wayne was the matinee lady. Anyway, Carol Wayne ends up dating Ed Durston. Okay. <laughs> I don't think that was the smartest decision that the ditzy blonde could play. Uh, she got in a little bit of a problem with The Tonight Show because Johnny Carson wanted to, to reduce his hours from the, doing the 90-minute show to a 60-minute show. And when they reduced The Tonight Show to a one-hour format, then Carol Wayne's uh, bit was cut from the show. So she found it hard to find work after she had typecast herself as the ditzy blonde matinee lady with the large breasts. Remember, that's Carol Wayne. So she finds herself in the arms of Ed Durston, who doesn't do well with women. And um, I'm trying to find the date here on this. Carol Wayne, where are you, Carol? Got it right here. So she's dating Ed Durston, and they decide to go off on a romantic uh, resort uh, vacation to Mazzanelli, to Mazzanello, Mexico, at the Las Hadas Resort. And they do this in 1985, in January 1985. You know, where the weather's nice and warm down there. You know, this is near Acapulco, but it's technically Mazzanillo. Anyway, they go on this vacation. They go for a walk on the beach. Ed Durston returns alone. He packs his bags. He packs Carol Wayne's bags. He checks Carol Wayne's bags at the airport. And Ed Durston flies back to Los Angeles without his date, Carol Wayne. Her body is later found face down in a lagoon, not too far from the resort hotel, uh, dead as a doornail at age 42. She's 42 years old in 1985. And we know that Ed Durston was um, 27 years old when Connie Monty and or Diane Linklater were killed. And this is 16 years, well, let's say at least 15 years later. So he's 42 years old also. So Ed Durston is 42, and Carol Wayne is 42, and Carol Wayne is dead. And again, Ed Durston is not charged or arraigned in the murder of Carol Wayne, despite the fact that he packed her bags and left it with Will Call at the airport in Mexico, apparently knowing that Carol was no longer going to be needing the room. Sort of a cognizant acknowledgement that he knew she was dead, right? So Ed Durston associated with three murders of dead women and never charged with a crime, given two polygraph tests after the um, Diane Linklater, but nothing comes of it. 
So he works for CIA. And then I have another source. I can't really get a double confirmation on it that Ed Durston's name appears in the Abigail Folger's black book, you know, like the Jeffrey Epstein black book, because she has an address book of names and people and phone numbers, right? Because she's infiltrated initially into the Robert Kennedy campaign in Manhattan, New York. Then when he's killed, then she's reassigned to the Tom Bradley campaign running for mayor of Los Angeles and given the provisional free housing in Laurel Canyon at 2774. Well, that's where Ed Durston works. He works West Hollywood, which is down the hill from where where Abigail Folger was moved into with her control agent, Wojtek Frykowski, who's 32 years old and he's Polish and he's twice divorced. So they're not dating. It's very important that you disregard all the media nonsense that uh, Abigail Folger was dating this older Polish CIA agent. She wasn't dating him. They were working together. Just like Sharon Tate was working with Roman Polanski as a fake wife, to a fake Polish CIA agent, Roman Polanski. And they had dinner with John Robert Kennedy two nights before he had his head blown off. Abigail Folger was in Manhattan when that happened. That was June 5th, 1968. Abigail Folger's working at the Gotham Book Mart and working at the Manhattan office for presidency of Robert Kennedy. See, they're working for the CIA. Don't you get it? Also, I want to discuss the James Dean situation and head-on collisions. James Dean sort of led the pack on that, you know, um, driving his Porsche Spider, which he was breaking in, getting ready to race that, that weekend. This is on September 30th, 1955. And I'm supposed to believe that a 23-year-old United States Navy sailor, Donald Turnipseed, Donald Turnipseed pulls in front of James Dean, who has the right of way, at the intersection of Highway 41 and Highway 46, which is very remote, there are no services there, and James Dean is declared dead on arrival in Paso Robles at the emergency room at 6.20 p.m., uh, which is before sunset. The collision happened at 5.45 p.m. Sunset is, is at 6.52. James Dean ha does have the sun in front of him, but it's not blinding because he has another hour and seven minutes. This... Um, this person, Donald Turnipseed, which I think is a cover name, he is not charged with vehicular manslaughter, and clearly he's guilty of felony manslaughter because James Dean died. I'm not sure that he had a passenger in the car. I'm sort of now of the opinion that James Dean was alone and that his three companions were in the Ford Squire station wagon hauling the empty trailer behind him, and that James Dean had this, uh, that this was a murder that was set up and that this... Uh, Donald Turnipseed was waiting there to pull in front of James Dean at the last second, causing this crash. The reason I say that, people, is that that's not the first uh, head-on collision that involves CIA operatives. Okay, that's in 1955, September 30th. James Dean is 24 years old. Then we have Christine Gale Hilton, Hint, Gale Hinton, H-I-N-T-O-N. She's 21 years old. She's from Marin County, which is Spooksville, USA, if you don't know. She lives in Nevada. She's dating, she's dating David Crosby. She had just returned from the Esalon Institute with David Crosby and Neil Young, who played their guitars in September 1969 at the Esalon Institute, which is a CIA mine restructuring center near Big Sur. It's actually 11 miles south of Big Sur, if you want to be technical. It's very close to the Hearst Castle. It's very close to the Hunter Liggett United States Army base, which is up the hillside from the Esalon Institute. In other words, a military facility. And she had just returned back home. She's 21 years old. And we're supposed to believe she borrowed David Crosby's Volkswagen bus to take her kitty cats to the vet and that one of the kitty cats jumped on her seat, and then she crashes into a school bus driven by a woman named Valerie Hansen, spelled H-A-N-S-E-N, -E who's 46 years old driving a school bus with only one child on the bus, driving an empty school bus. And she crashes the empty school bus into Christine Hinton, who's the girlfriend of David Crosby, and this happens on September 30th, 1969. Now, didn't I just tell you that James Dean 
had someone pull in front of him on September 30th, 1955. So 14 years later exactly, Christine Gail Hinton, who's dating David Crosby and just returned from the Esalon Institute, where you know they have a dossier on her, she's killed, she's killed at age 21 by an empty bus. Then I'm not done. Then we have Diane Linklater's older brother, Robert, who was 24 years old when she died. Anyway, he's killed on September 12th, 1980, on Santa Monica Boulevard, when Gracie Jones pulls out over the center line and T-bones Robert Linklater, who's 35 years old, killed instantly on Santa Monica Boulevard. That means that Art Linklater has now outlived two of his children. You know, he outlived David or John Zwire, his son-in-law. Then he outlived Diane Linklater, his baby daughter. Then he, uh, he outlives Robert Linklater, his son, who's 35. Then his oldest son, Jack, dies of cancer, so he outlives him. That's four people in his family that Art Linklater, who died at age 97, outlived. Then I'm not done. We have Sam Kinison, the great comedian, my number one favorite comedian. At age 38, again, uh, Sam Kinison with his uh, wife is driving to Laughlin, Nevada, where he's going to appear at the Riverside Casino to sold out crowds. His show is sold out. On April 10th, 1992, Sam Kinison is minding his own business, and a 17-year-old Troy Pearson drives over the center line, T-bone Sam Kinison, in much the same way that Gracie Jones did to Robert Linklater, Troy Peer Pearson did to Sam Kinison. Sam Kinison is 38 years old. He was the number one comedian for the Comedy Store, which is right down the street from where Jack Cassidy and Sal Minio were killed. They were killed on Holloway Drive and North Kings Road, which is walking distance to the Comedy Store which is where all the greatest comedians that you see get a television sitcom or appear on The Tonight Show. They all emanate from the Comedy Store on Sunset Boulevard. So I have James Dean killed by Donald Turnipseed. I have Christine Gale Hinton killed by Valerie Hansen, a bus driver of an empty bus. I've got Robert Linklater killed by Gracie Jones on Santa Monica Boulevard. I've got Sam Kinison killed by a 17-year-old Troy Pearson by going over the center line, killing age 38, Sam Kinison. That's four people murdered in head-on collisions. And I got, I got four women killed by acute barbiturate poisoning. Jean Harlow, Inger Stevens, Marilyn Monroe, Connie Monty. I got four women killed in the same method of murder. Acute barbiturate poisoning. Four women. I got three men and one woman killed in head-on car crashes. And they all live in Laurel Canyon or Benedict Canyon. Isn't that fascinating? All right, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll talk soon. Please do have a great rest of your day.